You walk into Mass on Sundays, and what do you hear? Light murmuring, babies crying, the shuffling of paper as congregants flip through the Sunday bulletin, and most likely, some kind of organ music, perhaps rehearsing with a cantor, or providing some sort of light prelude music to accompany prayer before Mass. Hailed as the king of the instruments, it's hard to imagine church without it, and there are several centuries worth of music for it. The pipe organ is our sacred note for today. We are back with On a Sacred Note. I'm Stephanie Sconia, and I have returned to St. John's Seminary today in Brighton, Massachusetts, to share with all of you some of the most intense liturgical music out there. This is a brief sojourn into the history of the pipe organ and some awesome composers that capitalized on its versatile sounds. The earliest appearance of the organ was actually in the third century BC. This one was powered by water. By the 500s and 600s, builders had developed a new form of the instrument, now powered by wind, through the use of manual bellows. Skipping ahead again, in the 1100s or so, we are seeing a more complex instrument. Basically, between the Renaissance and the Baroque periods, organ builders created more varied stops, which provided many different tone colors for the instrument. By the 14th century, pipe organs were becoming standard in churches across Europe. The organ was actually considered the primary church instrument now, with its powerful, larger-than-life sound that overwhelmed the senses in these echoing, floridly decorated churches of Baroque Europe. The organ is still a marvel today. If you take a close look, it's built often with dozens of stops, three or more keyboards called manuals, and of course, the foot pedals, which provide anything from light Baroque walking bass to the deep, loud, soul-rattling bass lines of some of the most showy romantic pieces. For our purposes, we will start with the Baroque period to say hello to our first composer of the day, Girolamo Frescobaldi, born 1583 and died 1643. He had an impressive 40-year career, including at St. Peter's Basilica, and is the seed of fantastic organ music for decades and centuries to come. He often used the technique of alternating solo organ with choral chant or polyphony in the mass, which developed into a genre called, appropriately, an organ mass. We also credit him for publishing organ music for virtually every Sunday and feast of the church year. Dietrich Buxtehude was another great name for another great composer. Buxtehude worked in northern Germany, Lübeck to be specific, and is revered for his contributions to the organ repertory. Unfortunately, less than 80 organ works of his have actually survived. Within that, though, there are many chorale settings for organ, which became a popular thing to do in Germany because recall that Martin Luther, forming his own following through the Protestant Reformation of the early 1500s, wrote many chorale tunes that were later harmonized by other composers. The organ provided a way to use chorale tunes as a sort of baseline melody for a more complex keyboard work. Also in Germany, we see Johann Pachelbel, born 1653, who worked within Catholic churches in an increasingly more Lutheran country. With his music, we get more lyrical writing than the North German Buxtehude. You may know his name, of course, from his famous Canon in D, still commonly used at weddings. If you haven't heard of the previous composers, I'm pretty sure you've encountered our next one. Johann Sebastian Bach, born 1685, is, of course, hailed as one of the greatest composers of all time. His music is mathematical and precise, yet he manages to accomplish the artistry that composers throughout the ages always worked for, the ability to surprise the listener, to stun with beauty, and to edify. We'll talk a bit about Bach's vocal works next time, but for now we'll focus on his compositions for organ. He wrote the majority of this repertoire while working in Weimar from 1708 to 1717 for the Lutheran service. He further standardized the use of the chorale prelude, a harmonization of a Lutheran chorale with embellishments and virtuosic treatment of the tune, specifically programmed before the service, as it would place in the congregation's ear the chorale that would be sung later in the service. 
The other huge genre of this period was the Toccata, a very technical, fast-moving piece that required nimbly trained fingers on the part of the instrumentalist. Toccatas were often paired with fugues, a style of imitative writing where the composer would place a brief theme in one of the organist's hands and then feature the theme in other voices, in this case, the organist's other hands or the organist's feet. The theme would keep reappearing like this and the polyphony would become denser and more complex as the different lines elaborate on the theme. Baroque fugues are notoriously difficult to write and to execute, but Bach was an expert. His pieces were masterfully crafted and incredibly evocative. In singing Bach's vocal pieces, I've been struck by the expressivity and style inherent in it. Bach passed away in 1750, where we mark the end of the Baroque period. In the 1700s, meanwhile, the piano was gaining popularity as the top keyboard instrument, so we can track a slight decline in the output of organ compositions. But by the 1800s, with the rise of Romanticism, we had revivalists, so to speak, including César Franck in France. Franck was a sought-after composer, organist, and teacher, thought to be one of the greatest organ composers after Bach. He, in turn, influenced and nurtured the rise of late Romantic and early 20th century organists of the French tradition, including Louis Vierne, Charles-Marie Vidor, and Marcel Dupré. Franck's music is reverent while also promoting virtuosity and grandness. He paved the way for the genre of the organ symphony, a multi-movement solo work showcasing the performer's ability. I don't think I'm stepping out of bounds by saying that the French really dominated Catholic organ music, especially as we continue through the 20th century with composers like Maurice Duraflay, Jean Langlais, and Francis Poulenc. By the end of the 20th century, many composers were still on the scene, now instilling more modern harmony and theory into organ works. Many organists themselves are also composers. Today, we see the organ mostly as a supportive instrument during the average Catholic Mass, accompanying the congregational hymns and responsorial psalms. But if you pay attention, you'll notice that in many cases, the organist will play a prelude before Mass and or a postlude after Mass to supplement the liturgy and provide meditative or celebratory music. At some higher level liturgies, the organist is required to provide music for some of the processional points in the Mass or to fill silences at key moments. This is part of the improvisational aspect of organ playing, the skills of which organists master as part of their professional training. Well, it's been great to break out of my comfort zone a bit as a singer and research one of the instruments I respect most. The dexterity, artistry, and patience of a professional organist continues to floor me, especially when they also must double as choir director at a parish. After the break, I'll chat with Janet Hunt here at the seminary to talk about her experience as an organist and which composers she loves the most. You won't want to miss it. Stick around. Hi, everyone. I'm Kevin Elson. On this month's Encounter, we'll be speaking with Kristen Jarvis Adams, who's written a book about her autistic son's relationship with his pet chicken that led to the boy's diagnosis of a rare disease. We'll also feature a segment on some women making a difference, dealing with the clergy sexual abuse crisis and caring for the victims. And we'll have our usual segments, including an obscure saint to tell you about. So please join us for this month's Encounter right here on Catholic TV. And don't forget, you can watch Encounter anytime by going to catholictv.com slash shows slash encounter. Where's Tommy? I thought he was with you. No. Jack! Tommy? Oh. <clears throat> Don't stop. Keep playing. Here we go. Here's the fun part. Encouragement. Pass it on. From the Foundation for a Better Life. Well, it is my distinct pleasure to be back in the gorgeous chapel of St. John Seminary, joined here by Janet Hunt, Director of Music and Organist Extraordinaire. Welcome back to the show, Janet. Thank you. So in addition to being an instructor here, you're an avid recitalist, a renowned uh, performer on the organ, uh, and, a, and a music editor, am I correct? Mm -hmm. So can you, do you have a favorite project or recital program that you've presented in the past, like a really great moment in, in your career that you want to share? 
I think the most recent one was right after the organ here was just completed in 2015. And so um, Easter season of that year, I asked three of my colleagues to come play in the Easter themed recital. Wow. And I decided I would do the Vidor Symphony Roman, which is his 10th and last um, organ symphony. And all four movements are based on the Easter gradual chant, Hey <sighs> Dias. And I knew about the piece, but I really didn't know that much about it, so I procrastinated starting. And once I started learning it, I absolutely fell in love with it. I, I can't remember a time when I have been more in love with oh something God. while I was working on it. And then I tried to find out more about it, and it turns out that Vidor, who's our impression of his personality, that he was very haughty and, and proud, but he admitted to his colleagues, he said, I am really struggling with this, trying to get it exactly the way that I want it, mm -hmm. having a hard time. So I kept that in mind while I was playing it, and I thought, well, this is what he finally decided was good enough and wrote down and, mm -hmm. and had printed. And I kept that in mind while I was playing. And after the concert, I had my organist friends came up and said, you know, that piece didn't make sense to me before now, and now it does. Oh, wow. And I thought, wow, it just all came together. That's wonderful. I, I love that piece. <laughs> you were channeling Vidor in that moment. That's wonderful. So. Maybe it's Vidor or maybe someone else. Name a favorite uh, organ composer and a couple favorite pieces. Well, besides Bach, who's the obvious of first course. favorite, there are two, two 20th century composers that I admire. Um, one is Herbert Howells. I oh, like his psalm yes. preludes, where he takes just one verse of a psalm and tries to depict that musically on the organ. He's mm -hmm. very effective. And another composer that I like is from the first half of the 20th century is uh, Hugo Diesler. Oh. Okay. And he wrote a um, partita on the ancient hymn, um, Veni Redemptor Gentium, or Nun Cum Der Heiden Highland. And there's a chacon as one of the movements that starts very calmly, and it gradually unfolds. And then it, suddenly it just becomes manic. And, it, <laughs> and it's followed by an even more manic toccata. Oh, that's it's very expressive. Well, we're going to have to check that out. I encourage everyone to do so. Mm -hmm. So now I just want to talk a little bit about the organ as an instrument itself and the role of the organist. So we know that organs can be made very complex <laughs> these days with the, the multiple stops, dozens sometimes, and, and multiple manuals and foot pedals and everything. And the, the role that the organist plays is, is versatile as well uh, with the improvisation that you sometimes have to do during mass. You accompany the hymns and uh, or a cantor or the choir or a solo instrument, and you're also a soloist yourself. So what's What's your favorite role as an organist? What, what makes you the happiest as an organist? I have, there are two things. One is I really do enjoy accompanying. And we, um, the men that are cantors here, we have a, uh, several very good ones. And so over the course of the years while they're here studying, we, you just develop this nonverbal rapport and you just learn how to work with each other. And so I do enjoy that immensely. But the other thing I enjoy just about playing the organ in general is trying to make it as expressive as possible, mm -hmm. just doing very subtle things with touch and with timing because people who don't know anything about it would just assume that it's not very expressive. Right. But, but just that's a lot of fun trying to figure out how to do that. Yeah, and every organ is a little bit different, too. Exactly, so and every sure. room is different, yes. so you play the room as well. Exactly. So we think of the organ, especially looking at the history of the church, as like the principal church instrument right up there with, with voice, of course, as well. But we talked a little bit about how the piano developed as an instrument in the 1700s and kind of became the most popular keyboard instrument to write for. Mm -hmm. So did the organ lose priority after that, do you think? And also, where are we today with the organ as far as people writing for it, uh, as far as it being the, pri the, the priority in a church? I know we have a lot of other instruments in church now, too. I think with the organ, it wasn't as if the piano supplanted it because they're just two completely different things. And piano does not sustain a group singing mm -hmm. because the, the sound dies out. I think what is unfortunate nowadays is that at the very same time that the Second Vatican Council met was also the time of folk music and everyone who had a guitar and knew three chords fancied him or herself as a musician and a composer. And I heard stories about after the council met of churches gleefully throwing out boxes of copies of the Liber Usualis thinking, oh good, we don't have to do this anymore. And a lot of traditional music just got tossed with it, unfortunately. Yeah. And we now have two generations of people who have, some of them have never sung with a pipe organ, they don't realize that it really is the best instrument for that. Mm -hmm. And I recognize that it's an expensive instrument, but if 
I did an experiment once of prorating the cost of a good instrument that might last 100 years, the amount of routine maintenance that if you did on a timely manner, it actually prorated, came out to less than what churches spend on flowers every week. Oh, wow. So seriously. <laughs> that tells you something, yeah. So where, briefly, where can our viewers music live, of course, in church, um, but are there any churches in Boston that have a regular recital series? Yes, I think um, the King's Chapel, I think oh, Trinity yes. Church, Copley Square. I know the First Lutheran has frequent recitals. Um, there are some churches that just had new organs installed or renovated who are, that are having recitals, such as St. Joseph's Needham has a recital yeah. coming up. So I think the best place to find out is on the Boston AGO website, Okay, and, there's, and click on Calendar. And if you wanted to hear um, organ on the radio or stream through the internet, there's a wonderful program called Pipe Dreams. Oh, yeah, that's on NPR. That. Yeah. Um, and they have one hour segments. Wonderful. Well, Janet, once again, thank you so much. Your expertise is always appreciated on the show. Oh, and you're very welcome. Yes, thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm Jay Fadden, and I want to invite you to join us Friday Live for This Is The Day. We'll meet Sister Catherine and Dixie of the Carmel Terrence Assisted Living Facility, which is in the greater Boston area. It's going to be a great show. So please join us later, Friday, for This Is The Day, right here on Catholic TV, America's Catholic Television Network. To most people, my grandfather, Vince Lombardi, was a great football coach. But my grandfather's legacy runs far deeper. As a devout Catholic and longtime member of the Knights of Columbus, Vince Lombardi built a legacy of faith and service for our family. Today, I'm proud to continue in my grandfather's footsteps as both an NFL coach and as a Knight of Columbus. Learn more about how you can build a lasting legacy of faith and service for your family by visiting kfc.org. I could never do justice to the centuries of development that the organ went through. Our detour away from choral music was all too brief, but I can tell you that this instrument is in great hands with Janet Hunt. Today we hear Janet perform two contrasting pieces from her repertoire. First up is a 17th century chorale prelude by Buxtehude, Von Gott will ich nicht lassen, followed by Marcel Dupre's Magnificat I from his Vespers of the Common Feasts of the Holy Virgin. Opus 18, composed in 1919. Enjoy.
Liturgical music may have started with singing, but there is nothing quite like the sound of a large pipe organ at full blast. Whether it's accompanying hymns or rocking the foundations of the church with the majestic ending of a Vidor organ symphony. Boston is chock full of amazing organs, and with them, organists, choir directors, and composers who know the instrument intimately. These individuals work behind the scenes with clergy, cantors, and choir members, not without stress at times, to make sure the liturgical music runs smoothly and complements the spirit of Mass. It's easy to forget about them as you run out of mass during their postlude to your Sunday brunch or take their hours of practice, planning, and rehearsing for granted. We all do it. Your mission, though, if you choose to accept it for next Sunday, take time after mass to remain in your pew, pray, and listen to the organist's postlude. Wait until it's finished, and then introduce yourself to the organist, thanking him or her for the work they do. Take it from a church musician. It means a lot. Next time on Sacred Note, we continue our break from strictly liturgical choral music and explore the sacred concert genres that developed, especially in the Baroque period and later. Until then, listen to some great church music, maybe share it with your neighbors, and God bless you and yours. <laughs>